Then uh, we move to the last paper of the session, and here we change on the fly, and I may ask um, Joao Granja and uh, Huyen Guyen to join me here on the panel. Okay, let's start without further ado, and I give the floor to Joao Granja from University of Chicago to present his paper. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to present here. Um, so what I'm, the title of the paper I'm presenting is how ineffective was bank supervision during the 2022 monetary tightening. This is joint work with uh, Yadav Gopala and is affiliated with uh, Fed St. Louis. So the usual, the usual disclaimer applies. Um, so, so today, so sort of the background of what I'm going to be talking about is um, the, the recent uh, crisis of the U.S. regionals. Um, so what we had was that we had two of the largest bank failures ever uh, in the world, uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Corporation. And one of the most striking facts about these two failures is that these are actually spectacularly simple failures, bank failures. So basically, we had a very simple combination of events that led to the demise of these banks. So basically, in these events and sort of this were that they were, these both banks were largely exposed to long-term securities. They lost significant market value when the Fed started raising rates. Um, they also had, um, a lot of these securities valued using health maturity accounting rules, which allow them to basically not mark down the value of these securities to their, to their market values and perhaps avoid some scrutiny from investors and delay sort of some corrective action to, that would be, would be prompted by market discipline. And then one plus two together probably wouldn't have brought the banks down, but in conjunction with the excessive reliance on uninsured depositors, uh, that basically created a big problem because once there were some fears uh, that the banks might be insolvent, these uninsured the, the depositors ran for the exits and created a liquidity crisis that brought basically the banks, uh, the banks to their demise. Um, everybody, when this happened, was up in arms. So one of the questions that people were asking is, where were the regulators? How did they let this, if this is so simple, how did they let this happen? And sort of this sentiment is actually echoed almost perfectly by John Cochran, who's a famous economist and blogger. And in his blog, he basically wrote, where were the regulators? The Dodd-Frank Act added hundreds of thousands of pages of regulations and an army of hundreds of, hundreds of regulators. The Fed enacts stress tests. How can this massive ar architecture fail to spot basic duration mismatch and a massive run prone deposit base. And so there's many, there's many possible explanations, right? I mean, we could think that maybe supervisors didn't understand what was going on. They, in, since the global financial crisis, most supervisors were actually focused on containing credit risks. And maybe they forgot about how to deal in, with interest rate risks. Maybe they actually lacked the discretionary powers to enact sufficient uh, corrective action. Maybe they had scarce supervisory resources and it couldn't be everywhere at the same time. Maybe they just decided to look the other way, which is another possibility that, uh, that basically is always concerning academics. Um, and so the problem is, is that it's actually very difficult to do an ex post, even an ex post evaluation of what went wrong because the whole process is shrouded in secrecy as we, as we all know, right? For, for justifiable reasons, the regulatory actions and supervisory actions are typically not publicly available for fears that that could actually might trigger a, a bank run. So we don't even know what the facts are, how regulators interpret and install what, what was coming, okay? So in this paper, what we're actually gonna do is that we actually have access, private access to this confidential database of uh, regulatory assessments, evaluations of banks. So basically, to explain better what this is, is the, so one of the main pillars of supervision, both here and in the US, is that banks, basic uh, supervisors go and do on-site supervisory examinations, 
And the main outcome of these on-site supervisory examinations in the US are these CAMELS ratings. That basically is an evaluation one through five evaluation of the bank in terms of their capital adequacy, asset quality, management quality, uh, earnings quality, liquidity, and sensitivity to risk. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use this special access that we have to, this, to these evaluations of the supervisors to try to ask very specific research questions, which are, these supervisors actually downgrade banks with large interest rate risks? If so, when? These supervisors downgrade banks that were excessively reliant on uh, uninsured deposits? If so, when? And these supervisors respond differently to unrealized losses in their portfolios, depending on whether they were these portfolios were valued using available for sale accounting or L to maturity accounting uh, that basically doesn't have to be marked down. Um, and then we even can ask, is it, did these rating downgrades actually help curb interest rates at, uh, and liquidity risk at the banks that were downgraded? Um, and in the end, we're going to try to basically collect all these facts and try to do some interpretation of what they might mean in terms of these questions of what might be the motivation for why, for, for what happened. Okay. All right. So, so, so Quick summary of main results. We are going to find that supervisors did see through some of these interest rates risks that were emerging in the system, and but they only reacted at, after the second quarter of 2022 when the Fed started tightening the, uh, the monetary policy. We never find that supervisors reacted to exposures to um, uninsured depositors um, or unstable sources of funding. We find that supervisors are faster to downgrade banks with more exposures to unrealized losses on available for sale, but not to unrealized losses on L to maturity. And we find that there's a there's a there's some effect of supervisory downgrades on banks' liquidity risk. They banks that basically are downgraded seem to reallocate some uh, securities from marketable some assets from marketable securities to cash, thereby reducing their liquidity and interest rate risks. Uh, we do some back of the envelope calculations, very, very simple exercise, policy exercise. We do some back of the envelope calculation, and we find that if the regulators had acted a little bit early, they would have saved 9.44 billion of, uh, or 0.1 percent of tier one capital. So very, so very tiny, very tiny uh, of effect if they had basically acted a little bit with a little bit more anticipation. So this is consistent with an interpretation that maybe supervisors did have some understanding of interest rate risks, but they probably acted a little, they might have acted a little bit earlier, and they did lack some uh, discretionary powers to correct some, to really correct some of these deficiencies. Um, all right, so I'm gonna pass the related literature uh, part for the sake of time. I'm gonna start by showing some descriptive statistics of the, what these on-site supervisor, uh, supervisor exams look like. So. So we're talking about, so the US system has about 5,000 commercial banks, uh, and banks basically are on site expected on regular intervals of 12 to 18 months, depending on their size. So that basically means that we have each quarter approximately uh, 800 to say 800, 700 on site supervisory exams that are conducted. Uh, out of these 700 supervisory exams, on average, we have a rate, as, as you can see here with the red line, we have a rate of downgrade of the composite camels of approximately 5%. This rate of downgrade, there, nevertheless, shot up to approximately 10% over the last, two, last quarter of 12, 2022 and first quarter of 2023. Um, the camels rating is nevertheless composed of a number of subcomponents, uh, as I said earlier, so the this capital adequacy, asset quality, et cetera, et cetera. And what we can see over here is actually there's different trends across these different subcomponents. Uh, I, I excuse me for the color palette that is not difficult to, is, is a little bit difficult to differentiate between the two, the, the, the six components. But what we see here is that whereas the capital adequacy rate of downgrade has been decreasing over time, and the same for asset quality management and earnings, they've been mostly stable, we see that the rate of downgrade of the liquidity component of the, of the CAMELS rating has shot up starting with the, with the second quarter of 2022. 
And uh, the, also the rate of downgrade of the sensitivity to risk component has also been increasing a little bit more steadily since 2022 Q1, okay? So basically this is uh, the main sort of aggregate patterns of the, the, the outcomes of supervisory examinations. And now we're gonna start basically showing you some data about what our supervisors were accessing these exposures to risks, sources of funding, etc. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to show you is a univariate plot of how uh, supervisors assess interest rate risk. What we're doing here is basically splitting all the banks that were examined into five quintile bins that depend on their, on their interest rate risk exposure and where the interest rate risk is measured by the, the average duration of the securities portfolio. Uh, what we see here is that pre-monetary tightening, meaning pre-2022 Q2, basically the rate of supervisory downgrade of the S ratings and sensitivity to risk rating is mostly flat around uh, across the five quintal bins. After 2022 Q2, when the Fed started raising rates, we see a different story. We see that the banks whose securities portfolios were least exposed to interest rate risks, they, they see some of increasing downgrade, but this increasing downgrade is much less pronounced compared to the banks that were most exposed to interest rate risks, okay? So obviously this is a new univariate, this is a new univariate plot. So we are gonna ask me for some regressions here to show that this is basically something that holds up when you control for other things and it does, okay? So basically we have that the interaction of the share of long-term securities with post, with a post, I mean where post is again after 20, the, the Fed started tightening rates, uh, basically implies an increase uh, in the rates of downgrades of both the L component and the S component. Um, the result uh, basically implies that the likelihood of downgrade increases by nine percentage points. I mean, most more than doubles uh, when a bank goes from having no long-term security to having all of its securities portfolio in long-term security, okay? When I introduce bank fixed effects, this is an interesting result here. When I introduce bank fixed effects, we see that the results attenuate a little bit. There's two things about this. The first one is that when I introduce bank fixed effects, I'm, all, I'm only identifying all the banks that basically were inspected twice over the, over the sample period, which begins in 2021 and, and ends in the end of 2022, which means that I basically my sample is reduced. The other thing is actually, I wouldn't necessarily expect the bank fixed effects to basically be doing anything positive in terms of this analysis. Let me explain you why. When I introduce bank fixed effects, we're basically uh, estimating out the changes, okay? But what if what really happened is that regulators out of the sudden became much more sensitive or much more preoccupied about the level of interest rate risk, the changes might not actually be the right place to, to, to be looking at, right? Because a bank might actually be stable in their interest rate risk at a very high level. And after the second quarter of 2022, the regulators became much more preoccupied about this very high level. And so maybe that's why there's a little bit of attenuation here. But mostly the, I think the results paint a point, uh, consistent picture of reaction to interest rate risk uh, after the monetary tightening began. Then I basically bail out, uh, lay it out on a dynamic on a dynamic sense, and when we do that, we actually see that the sensitivity of the regulator to um, to the interest rate risk of banks really kicks in in the second quarter of 2022, as we exactly when the monetary policy tightened, um, and basically stays high until the end of our sample period, which is 2022 Q1. Uh, before that, basically, we see nothing, no sensitivity to, to interest rate risks. And finally, one thing that you might ask, well, but, but what if your interest rate risks are just proxying for basically financial health or poor financial health? I, th we, I would say, yes, that's possible. But if this is proxy proxying for poor financial health in general, we might expect the other there to be a relationship also with the other subcomponents of the camel of the camel's rating, and when I basically when we correlate the interest rate risk measure with other subcomponents of the camel's rating, including the composite camels, we actually see no 
sort of a no relationship after the monetary tightening, which basically it can, does a little supports a little bit our channel that what the regulators were actually reacting was to exactly these exposures. Um, all right. So this is all I have for you in terms of the, how regulators reacted to interest rate risks over the tightening period. Next, I'm going to try to basically put some data in terms of how they reacted to these liquidity exposures. And I'm going to sort of cut short. I'm gonna, just going to show you the main result that mimics the, the second to last result that I've shown you for the previous analysis. And basically, when I look well, at this graph that basically asks, did supervisors downgrade with banks with greater exposure to unstable sources of funding, we see that the S rating uh, doesn't really move much, doesn't, is not sensitive to the share of uninsured depositors of each, of, the, of each bank. Okay. So this might be surprising how the regulators miss this, but in some, in some way actually resonates with the post-mortem of SPB, uh, the, with the so-called bar report. Um, they basically did criticize <laughs> the, 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 the supervision of, the, of SPV and other banks by basically by basically suggesting that the supervisory models didn't do enough to account for these unstable sources of funding. We're sort of confirming that the findings of that report on a much, on a much larger scale here. Um, next, I'm going to show you sort of what I have in terms of results of, of um, the differential response of supervisors to losses embedded in the AFS and HGM portfolios. So were supervisors less sensitive to losses in the HDM portfolio? And the answer, and the answer seems yes. Okay, it seems to be yes. So basically, supervisors reacted after the second quarter of 2022 to unrealized losses in the available for sale portfolio, which basically are losses that basically need to be marked down on the balance sheets of banks. Um, but didn't, interestingly, didn't statistically significant react to unrealized losses in the HDM portfolios until the SVB debacle in the first quarter of 2022, right? So it almost seems like we basically need, we needed, they needed the bank failure to happen for, to remind themselves that there's, there's lingering losses in this, in this portfolio that maybe were not being taken into account, but that they're still, if something goes badly, they still could hit basically the, the capital, uh, the capital of banks. All right, so taking stock, supervisors downgraded banks most exposed to interest rate risks. They were not more likely to downgrade banks with greater reliance on unstable sources of funding. They were faster to downgrade unrealized losses with a, a, in AFS than they were uh, unrealized losses in HPM. So what factors next, the next questions are, what factors explain this pattern? Uh, is it sophistication? Is, is it supervisory resources forbearance? And did these downgrades actually help curb interest rate risks? Um, so in terms of the first question, the first place that we went to look at, and which was very simple, is that you know we have actually now a very established literature that we actually talked about already today very ma many times that uh, there seems to be significant heterogeneity in how supervisors in the US actually are stricter or have more or less resources. So the first thing that we thought, okay, let's look at this. Let's look at whether the, the regulators that are basically federal, federal regulators acted differently than the, the regulators that, were, that are state agencies. Um, and so basically uh, against all my priors, and hopefully that, this, this is why I think research is for, right? against all my priors, uh, basically we found that the way the Fed agencies and the state agencies were evaluating interest rate risks were pretty much the same. Uh, it turns out that they both basically picked up the sensitivity to interest rate risks, picked up exactly in the second quarter of 2022. Okay? We've, did, we've redone this, this is not in the paper, where we also did this plot with, uh, for the um, unstable sources of funding, and HDM versus AFS, and interestingly, if anything, it did seem all, all that the state agencies might have been, even have been a little bit earlier in anticipating the issues with losses in the HDM portfolio. Okay, this is not in the paper, but it's something that will be in a future version. Um, 
So, <laughs> so this basically uh, leaves us sort of Kind of, this kind of dismisses the possibility that this, uh, this, diff, this pattern of behavior uh, is explained by what we would expect our supervisory resources or sophistication, because at least if we believe the lessons from the prior literature that the federal agencies do have more resources and are more sophisticated, you know, this, this plot does seem to dismiss some of those justifications for the, the results that we have. Um, so next, what we do is actually try to figure out what good came out of these downgrades and I mean, what, 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 what did they accomplish? Uh, and what we see here is that there's some evidence that the downgrades did result in a reduction in the interest rate risk. So after the downgrades, banks basically uh, reduced their interest rate risk measured again by the duration of the securities portfolio. Uh, but not by a lot. So in terms of uh, ma economic magnitudes, this downgrade basically resulted in a one percentage point decrease uh, in the percentage of long-term securities in banks' portfolios, um, which is basically 5% of their overall uh, um, sort of relative, 5% relative to their unconditional level of exposure to long-term securities. Um, we also find that um, there seems to be some reallocation from securities to cash. Again, sort of this will be consistent with the reduction, reduction in interest rate risks. Um, although here the results do seem to kick in even prior to the, um, to the, um, to the downgrade itself, which might be consistent either with some anticipation effects or even some, with some mean reversion that is not necessarily created by the, by the downgrade itself. Okay, so the jury is still out on that. We're still looking at this, but um, the other caveat that I basically should mention is that we have to end, we had to end the sample in 2023 Q1. So another thing why we might not be seeing very strong effects in this in this analysis is that maybe we haven't had enough of a enough of a period for the results to start kicking in. Maybe banks need more time to basically complete their reallocation. But we but the re, and so the results might might become more pronounced as we add uh, more periods into the, um, into the sample. Um, so now policy discussion. So what does all of these means um, in terms of uh, our perspective? And so here, sort of the, the question that we posed ourselves was, if regulators understood these interest rate risks as they seem to have understand and understood, uh, why were they unable to prevent the, the regional banking crisis? Right, so what, why, why didn't they didn't do enough to prevent? And so maybe one possibility that might be consistent with some of our findings is that they might have lacked the ability or the authority to enact, uh, to force banks to, to make a significant, uh, a significant reallocation. And the results that we just showed you in terms of reallocation to securities to cash might actually provide, might be consistent with this. So basically banks on average reallocate securities to cash in the amount of 0.5% of total assets. And this is basically a small uh, drop in the ocean uh, when, we basically, when we consider that banks on average held in the US held 27% of their total assets in AFS and HGM securities at the time of the, at the, time of the crisis. So 0.5% was definitely might have not been enough to basically make any change. And the other thing that we basically um, discuss is whether it might have been possible to have better coordination between monetary policy and supervision. Uh, and if, if that had happened, maybe that would have allowed for earlier intervention. Uh, in, in fact, markets were already predicting uh, an interest rate uh, hike already by late 2021. Uh, and so maybe if the, if the regulators have been sort of uh, informed or basically suggested that there was a strong possibility, maybe they might have acted a little bit earlier on starting down the, this downgrading sensitivity that I have shown you, and they might have basically curbed some, some of the problems that we saw later. Uh, we do a little bit of a back of the envelope computation of um, for how much might have, how much pain might have been saved if the regulators had started downgrading earlier on. Uh, and the results basically, it's, again, 
let the exercise is the following. Let's suppose that the, re the model, the regression model that the regulators used after 2022 Q2, they had used it starting in 2021 Q4, and let's uh, assume that there would have been a similar portfolio reallocation after the downgrade. There would have been no effects on the tra tra trajectories of uh, security prices, and the composition of reallocated securities would have been sort of similar to the overall portfolio. If, if we assume all of this, <laughs> and obviously are, these are heroic assumptions, uh, the average averted losses would have been 9 billion or 1% of tier one capital for the banks that were, um, that would have been downgraded in those two quarters, but were not because the regulators didn't act early enough, right? And so with this, I conclude, basically, if, I, if you basically take away something from this paper, what I would like you to take away is that there's basically three simple facts about uh, supervision and during the 2022 monetary tightening, the supervisors did seem to have reacted to the interest rate risk uh, exposures, but only after tightening began. They did not incrementally downgrade uh, banks in response to higher exposures to unstable sources of funding, and they incrementally downgraded banks with large and realized AFS, uh, losses in AFS, but not in HDM. Um, findings suggest that maybe some policy, a better policy coordination uh, would be of limited effect if not accompanied by a bigger stick uh, to exert basically prompt reallocation. There's a few open questions. We, we need to basically, what that we want to do, we would like to rule in something in terms of explaining variation in, the, uh, in, the, in these effects. Uh, maybe what, what explains reactions earlier rather than later. And we would like to basically also understand how does this cycle compare with prior monetary cycle, tightening cycles, and this is something that we're actively working on right now. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Um, wow, and <clears throat> discussant of the paper is Wu Yen Guyen from Halle Institute for Economic Research. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Klaus and Andreas for having me here to discuss this really fascinating paper on how ineffective was bank supervision during the 2022 monetary tightening. So Jonas did really clear presentation. So, uh, and I also admit that there are some comments that I have today, the author already addressed in the presentation. Um, so largely it's gonna be uh, essentially, my comment is going to be on the interpretation of the result, mechanism analysis, and also some part on the identification. So the research question is essentially, first of all, what did bank supervisors actually do? Did they downgrade banks with less exposure to interest rate risk? And the answer from the paper is yes, and only for the liquidity and sensitivity grades that are relevant for the interest rate risk exposure of the bank. And essentially, if so, what did they do? And the paper found that only after the Fed already raised the interest rate in quarter two, 2022, that supervisors started to downgrade banks. They actually did not downgrade bank based on unstable funding sources. And when we look at the unrealized losses between available for sale portfolio and how to maturity security portfolios, banking supervisors seem to put more effort into looking at the available for sale portfolios. And finally, on the effectiveness of supervision, we see some partially yes that Downgraded bank did take some action to reduce interest rate risk. So in order to do so, the author have really this amazing data on on-site examination of banking supervisors. So this is something that this is the first time for me to see how the data look like. And essentially, this serve as really clear example of when the supervisor do, what did they do, and the implication of that. And then they most this universe of commercial bank camels ratings between quarter four 2020 um, until quarter one 2023 and combined with the core reports from the bank. Um, 
in terms of identification strategy, we have this continuous treatment effect with various variables. First of all, interest rate risk exposure. Second is on the unstable deposit. Third is on the unreliable losses between AFS and co to maturity portfolios. And the second part of the paper, which I will talk a little bit more um, later, is essentially link the supervisory actions to bank risk taking. So my assessment of the paper is that it's contained all the elements for top publication because it's really timely and important topic. It's linked directly the failures of several US banks in 2023 after the Fed tightened their monetary policies after a really long time that we have this low interest rate environment. And when I track all the top publication in the top three finance journals in the past 15 years, I could only find seven papers on the broader team of banking supervision and none of the paper actually look exactly that what did bank supervisors do. So I would like to congratulate the authors on that. So my first comment gonna be on the interpretation of the result, which I think already addressed during the presentation, but was not included in the paper, which is when we look at the time frame between quarter four 2020 and to quarter one 2023, we have this Fed raised the interest rate first time already in March 2022. And this time even a little bit after that, like one quarter more or less, we see the downgrade incident happen for those banks. So it seems that bank supervisors are aware of the interest rate, but they did not act fast enough. Actually, they acted even after the market already know about the Fed decision. And I reflect a little bit on the kind of what should we think about banking supervision? It should actually act in the way that is give warning signal before the bad time happened, right? So when we already have this interest rate raising in 2022, those banks actually have kind of double penalties. On the one hand, they hit by interest rate risk, so they essentially have profitability decline. And at the same time, they face a scrutiny from the bank supervisors. And the author essentially pointed out that if this action happened two quarter before the Fed raised the interest rate, it would save a lot of effort. And at the same time, we would have this approach of essentially banking supervisors should be tightened during the good time and maybe less tight during the bad time. My second comment on the mechanism analysis. So I split it into two points. The first point is on the first order effect of the result when we have monetary policy tightening and essentially lead to the change in uh, liquidity and sensitivity rating of the banks. So here my question is that what should we think about the nature of the shock? We have 2022 quarter two being really a kind of event that really is spectacular because we did not think of this big increase in interest rate after such a long time with low interest rate, right? So whether is this the kind of shock that changed the belief of market participants and also bank supervisors on the role of interest rate risk because they did not look at that too much when interest rate was low? Or is this something else because Unfortunately, in that quarter, we also have a lot of things going on. We have ending of forbearance policies after the pandemic. We have big problem of supply chain disruption that raising inflation. And then we have geopolitical tension as well. So maybe a small suggestion in here is that, of course, we cannot rule out all the alternative explanation. But what we could do is that maybe interact instead of the post-2022 quarter two, with some direct measurement of monetary policy, for example, Fed rates, or even better, supply element of monetary policies there. And on the second part, which I actually really love in the paper, is that it talks about the effectiveness of banking supervision, where we have this downgraded banks, what happened to them? Did they reduce interest rate risk? And what way that they use to reduce this risk. So here, I really like the analysis, but at the same time, I was thinking, is this because they are afraid of 
further corrective action, maybe they're afraid that after they get downrated and they don't do anything, at some point there will be enforcement actions. But from my talk with John, actually, the corrective action happened really rarely, unless the bank is really underwater that they fail at some point, this rarely happens. So is this then because they obtain new information from bank supervisors that they updated how they value the risk, the risk and because of that, they, for example, hold more cash and hold less of long-term securities. So my suggestion here is that maybe it would be good to bring in the kind of discuss about objective function of banking supervisors. And I see that sometime in the paper, the, the terminologies used between supervisors and regulator was kind of interchangeable. And I think that is actually quite separate because um, banking supervision kind of like more on the kind of on-site examination, whereas regulation is a little bit different. It's applied for kind of all the banks uh, based on certain rules. So my suggestion here is also on the information channel of banking supervision. So in the second stage of the analysis, when we see um, some measurement on interest rate fixed exposure, bank B at time T is a function of whether that bank downgraded. So what I think here is that in the figure, we saw that downgrade happened a lot after monetary policy tightening. This leads to the question that what we observe here is this because of the downgrade itself or is this because already monetary policy changes and those banks, they see that if they hold, keep holding long-term securities, they're going to incur loss and because of that, they change rather than because of downgrade. So this means that it would be good to streamline the kind of uniquenessness of bank supervision and we have a, um, essentially quite a few papers talking about the theory behind why bank supervision could affect bank behaviors. For example, the early paper by Berger at all 2000 that show what does bank supervisor do and why they do it. And then we have also recently a theory paper by Eisenbach at all 2016 also talk about this information channel of uh, bank supervision. So after the on-site examination, there will be more collection exercise in terms of new information collected. And because of that, these banks that got supervision on site, they learn from the supervisors what they would do to um, adjust the risk assessment. So this is, I have two suggestions, and I think the first suggestion really dependent on data availability. So whether you would have in your confidential data some information that banks reported maybe more um, items, um, accounting items, also would be fine after they receive this on-site examination. And the second test would be that, okay, let's say if we don't have that fantastic data, then we can also look at stock prices of those banks responded after on-site examination to see that there's some information generated from that. So then my final details comment going to be on a bit of boring identification strategy. Um, so I come back to the first regression that you have where um, the dependent variables is the decision of bank supervisors on downgrade of uh, essentially bank I at time T. And this is the function of interest rate risk exposure of the bank and interacted with post-2022 uh, 20, quarter two. In a normal difference in different setup, we would hope for a treatment status that should not change over time. So essentially we would have the kind of banks that classify into high interest rate risk with the bank that low interest rate risk and that status would not change. Obviously here we would not have that because it's changed all the time. And the beauty of using this interest rate risk um, treatment, continuous treatment also over time is that you can observe the direct effect of exposure of interest rate on the downgrade decision. But at the same time, this beta one gonna capture any kind of changes in bank behavior during this also tightening of monetary policy. 
So the suggestion is that maybe in the robotic case, you could do the pre-shock interest rate risk inquiry only at the bank level, and then there you can have this um, absorbed by the bank fixed effects. This leads to my next point on the fixed effects. So you have this result that when you have bank fixed effect included in, sometimes the result essentially disappear. What I think is that instead of having this bank fixed effects, what you could do is having this supervisor fixed effect because we have 12 local Fed um, supervisors, and then you could introduce essentially supervisor fixed effect or even supervisor time time fixed effects that capture essentially the kind of level of leniency in their action. I just stop here with the clustering of standard error and, and essentially um, you have this cluttering of standard error at the headquarters state of the bank, whereas we have here interest rate risk is specific to bank and the downgrade decision is from each supervisor. So I would suggest that maybe having also clustering at bank or better at the supervisor level of the bank would uh, do a good job. And since I have minus one minute left, I stop here and save for the further result implication for bilateral uh, chat. <clears throat> Thank you, Huyen. And um, we collect questions from the audience. It starts on the left hand side. Oh, many questions. Very good. We start in the first. First row first, please. Okay, thank you. I might have missing something, but I, as far as I remember, um, in the US, banks of that size are not subjected to liquidity regulation, to liquidity, minimum liquidity standards. So, so my question is, could you run like back on the envelope calculation as you did in your presentation and maybe tell us whether things could have improved should these banks apply the both nest stable funding ratios and the liquidity coverage ratio? Then I think there was behind. Okay. Diana first. Thank you, Klaus. So um, two questions. One is you have this interesting result about supervisors reacting more to um, the available for sale uh, portfolio than the held to maturity. To what, what is the role of accounting rules? So if everything was marked to value, do you think the reaction of supervisors, that would be helpful for supervisors as well? The second question is about, I mean, monetary tightening also has very positive effects for banks, especially for those with more traditional intermediation profiles, right? And so some European banks are now making record profits with, with, with higher interest rates. So is it possible that supervisors also took that into account and there's some heterogeneity depending on the business model of the banks and how monetary policy actually affects them positively or negatively? And two lines, two rows afterwards, please. Good. Uh, well, my, my question on, on regulation has already been made, so two, two, two other uh, uh, fast comments. Uh, the first one is that, that well you have explained it very very well that the um, uh, um, situation in Silicon Valley, uh, Valley Bank and other, and other banks was created by the combination of interest rate risk, uh, high exposures, uh, uh, held to maturity, plus instability of of funding sources. I, I, I miss a bit more of a, a, a focus on on the f in instability of funding sources because this this was what was unique to this to this bank many other banks have important interest rate uh, exposures and in fact there was a market scrutiny about that and not many uh, not many banks failed so so it would be interesting to to uh, s um, s check why the supervisors didn't put more attention on this on this uh, asset mal liability management uh, issues and whether the reaction could could have been uh, faster um, an additional, an additional question, a, a reflection after your conclusions. You have shown that that a faster reaction would have been positive, but would wouldn't have uh, avoided uh, uh, very important losses uh, uh, anyway. So, uh, in a in a sense, your your results uh, show that additional different supervisory tools, more aggressive, more intrusive uh, action, uh, more effective action is needed on the side of super supervisors. One question from the middle, 
And then we take one from the side and then we need to close. I'm sorry. The rest questions and we can maybe bilaterally in the break. But please. And uh, or a jealous observation. Obviously, I agree with Ian that the paper has all the ingredients for a top publication, but I think on top of that, uh, the set of results you have is also a perfect recipe to generate a tremendous amount of citations because there's something for everyone in there. You know, the supervisors can basically feel vindicated and say, look, we, we did raise red flags. It's not like we were asleep at the steering wheel. On the other hand, Paul Krugman can still criticize them for missing some really important parts. And the academic community at large can, can be happy that, you know, now we know that the exposure to uninsured depositors is really the, the new, the one characteristic feature of that bank run versus previous episodes, right? So um, I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out. And I guess uh, the only downside for you is that your co-author's last name starts with G-O and your G-R is gone. Okay, one question on the, okay, maybe two. Then it's, then it's closed. Yeah, th thank you very much. Online, right? So uh, a quick one. Uh, was the situation of March 2023 20, as a as a result of sort of like a, a broad or bad equilibrium of the of the market where there was a belief that the, you know parking money in HTM would be a way to actually manage the the interest rate risk instead of actually managing properly you know hedging the the interest interest rate risk yeah so in a sense maybe you know the uh, you know, the way to deal with the, the problem wasn't just about the supervisors sort of, you know, issuing a specific, you know, down, downgrade messages, but it was a, 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 a deep, deeply rooted problem of risk management and investors' perception, you know, what would be the way actually to de deal with that. Thank you. The last one for David, a quick one, please. Thank you, David Zachowski from the SSM. Um, a very nice and thought-provoking paper. Um, so um, I think all have been said, but what made me, uh, made me thought is that, uh, y you know, uh, y you were showing that, you know, the supervisors reacted somehow exposed to the events of the monetary policy changes. And in the spirit of what Claudia Bush said this morning, that we should be forward looking. So haven't we uh, learned anything as a supervisors, right? So saving and loans uh, crisis in 80s, this is the, the very same story. Banks fail when you increase the interest rates and you have maturity mismatch. Banks are maturity, mess, uh, maturity transformation animals. And this is what we should be supervising, right? So uh, maybe instead of focusing on, you know, slow moving credit risk losses that are never really a trigger to the default of a bank, it's, it's always, you know, market pushing for exit or deposits uh, running. So it's always a kind of a market sentiment that something is going on, underlying losses, and here we go, right? So shouldn't we put more focus in this forward uh, uh, supervision on uh, liquidity, on funding mismatches to make banks resilient this way. So this, let's say, liquidity part more or the, less the uh, risk to capital. The second, th uh, second thing I wanted to raise is the, you said, where were the regulators? And that was all over in the press. But my question would be, where was the management of the bank? Yeah. And what I said, what I read in the press uh, articles after the event was that actually only one board member had any clue about financial banking. The others were tech people. So the question would be, hasn't, shouldn't the Fed or, well, here, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, federal regulator looking more at the uh, quality of the management. So in Camels, that is M, I guess, for management. Uh, have you looked into that, whether there is any link or there is no link? Because that would be also quite insightful to know. Thank you. So back to Drow for a concise response to the question. <laughs> OK. Uh, liquidity re regulation, yes, would love to do that. My only caveat there is that I, I do think some of the ratios that are used in these liquidity regulations probably use inputs that I'm not sure we will have access uh, to. Um, 
AFS versus HTM, very important policy discussion. And it's one of the things that are really brewing right now is whether we should get rid of the HTM classification, given that it's completely, so the HTM, again, so what is this is that they're committing to all this thing until maturity, but the, because they have the intent and the ability to do it, but if the ability to alter material is completely unverifiable, should we even have the HTM classification at all? So that's basically the, the, the question that, that I think supervisors are, and regulators are sort of asking. And yes, so there's effects on record, the, there's record profits, but that's uh, totally highly dependent on the value of the deposit franchise, right? So that's where I think this basically uh, uh, relates to a, also another question that, that I had, which is probably what's really key here is the interaction between the strength of the deposit franchise the ability of to basically maintain um, the cheap deposits and sticky deposits. And if they have this ability, but then the interest rate risks won't be that pronounced because they, they, they will be a natural economic hedge. Um, so in terms of sort of, then I had a question about sort of this broader equilibrium in terms of the HTM AFS. So I, I think one, one thing which is very interesting is, you know, the, investors weren't at all sort of um, able to sort of price in the HGM and, and realize its losses as well. Basically, we have in data uh, and papers showing this. And this probably, and if they had priced in, maybe the correct, there would be corrective me mechanisms prompted by market discipline that would have kicked in faster and that would probably, that might have uh, resolved some of the issues and that, then later on got compounded, compounded, and they would not have been compounded if they had acted earlier. And yes, we did look at management, and with management we see a flat line. There's no sensitivity uh, of exposures to uh, stable sources of funding or IRR to with the management, which in some way could also be seen as a as a failure of, of supervision if we believe that one of the that's one of the things that they do is basically make sure that we have good management in place. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks a lot.